This is your daily dose of all things royal. Welcome back, my gorgeous, good-looking friends. Yes, this picture is going to come back and haunt Harry and Meghan till the end of time. I'm bringing this photo back up because, yes, Harry and Meghan were at the United Nations, and yes, they were meeting with the World Health Organization, and in that meeting was Lois Pace. Now, if you had the chance to go check out the video that I did on the WHO pandemic treaty that is being forced through at this moment, you would know the whole corrupted nature of what is going on right now, especially with these globalists. And fresh off the heels of Davos, the WHO is back and today, very stealthily, held a meeting and an update around the two agreements that they're trying to lock together will take away our sovereignty. Sure, in the pandemic accord or treaty that they're putting together does say that the states have the right to govern their own country. But in the second document that they're interlocking with it, which is the updated international health regulations, it is forcing countries to change their regulations and law to abide by these updated amendments, which at this moment, they said that there's about 300 of them that they're updating, which includes digitizing, pushing central IDs, and then blanketing in this pandemic preparedness accord treaty. So even though they're saying to your face, no, the pandemic treaty does not take away sovereignty. Yes, they're telling the truth there, but it's in a very manipulative way because by default, every member state participating have to abide by the law that is being updated at this moment. And that's where they get you. And that's where they take away people's personal sovereignty. This is so dangerous. But in this video that I'm going to share here with you, the biggest gripe that these people have is the fact that there's a lot of so-called misinformation, disinformation flowing around. No, it's called people having debate and questioning what they're doing and not being able to be a part of these conversations and seeing how Western world countries are selling their people out. I'm going to play the informal session because nobody is talking about this because it's so under the radar and being done in stealth mode. You guys are free to make up your own mind. They can't come back and say, oh, this is misinformation, disinformation when you're hearing it from the horse's mouth. And that, I think, is important. I think everybody needs to see this for themselves to make the decision. Is this something you're comfortable with? My personal feeling is no, I don't trust these people as far as I see them. They are just plain evil. And in this session, the countries that you would expect want to have intel and inside information and this transparency are on the fence about it. I mean, there's a lot of problems and there is this big rush to get to May 2024, which makes you wonder, why are they so gung-ho about not missing the month of May in completing this? Could it be that they are deathly afraid of the U.S. election and what is going on here? To me, I think that's playing a part of it. And you'll see the woman, Lois Pace, you know, Megan's buddy, this Marxist, is all gung-ho about making sure this gets done in a timely fashion because she said, you know, as we ramp up closer to, you know, the, the closing time of this, there's going to be more misinformation, disinformation. She's already been getting pushback from the senators and the representatives here in the United States because of the lack of transparency of these 300 amendments that are going to be thrown up for vote in May, and not anybody's going to get a chance to review it beforehand. Certainly not the American people are going to get to see it. So whatever is being signed away or voted by whoever is the elected person of the member states, that's it. We're locked in and committed. And I don't trust Lois Pace because in Congress, her testimony already had fault with it, which I pointed out in the video that I presented. If you want to check that out, I'll link that below. As an FYI, you'll know who Miss Pace is because she's the only one wearing a face mask and sitting next to, of all countries, Yemen. But I'll let you guys decide what you think about this WHO pandemic treaty and what 
this group that's a non-elected government body is doing in order to take away our rights. I think it's a bad idea, but hey, they want you to trust them because after all, in Davos, the whole theme was rebuilding trust. So just because they say so, yeah, we have to do it. Particularly Dr. Tedros, who, by the way, is not even a medical doctor and during the pandemic was in bed with the Chinese and covering up for them. Yeah, that guy, he wants us to trust him. F that. I say no, I do not comply. Also, some asks for the EB member support. It is my great pleasure to start by asking our Director General, Dr. Tedros, to uh, deliver his opening remark. And also, we welcome the EB Chair to this informal briefing. Thank you, Excellency, for being with us. DG. Thank you. Thank you, Jawad. Uh, Co-chairs of the IHR Working Group, Dr. Ashley Bloom Bloomfield and Dr. Abdullah Hasiri, and vice chairs, co-chairs of the IMB, the IMB, Precious Masoso, Roland, Roland Dries, and vice chairs, esteemed members of the executive board, our EB chair, Dr. Hanan, excellencies, dear colleagues and friends. Let me begin by welcoming you all to this briefing and thanking you for your commitment to strengthening pandemic prevention, preparedness, and response. Over the past two years, the Intergovernmental Negotiating Body and the Working Group on Amendments to the IHR have been moving towards a common goal, to build a healthier, safer, and more equitable world. This is our chance, maybe our only chance, to get this done because we have the momentum. When COVID-19 struck, we acted with urgency to respond. We found new ways of working together. We did this because we had to. We need that same sense of urgency now. We must be bold and we must be creative to overcome hurdles, entrenched positions and old ways of thinking. This is the only way we can make the world safer for our children and our children's children through working together. Member states have committed to the historic task of delivering a pandemic agreement and a package of amendments to improve the international health regulations to the World Health Assembly in May this year. This is a generational opportunity that we must not miss. After the experience of the COVID-19 pandemic, the world is watching. The stakes are high and time is short. It's difficult to overstate the importance and urgency of this work. If the international community misses this, this opportunity, it will be difficult to achieve the comprehensive reform we need especially for equitable access to pandemic-related products. What we need is a meaningful and impactful outcome to strengthen the international legal framework for strengthening pandemic prevention, preparedness, and response. But if the final products do not change the status quo, and if they do not help to ensure collective security and equity, then we will have missed our chance to make history. This work is not easy. And it's occurring in a very difficult environment. The IMB and the IHR working group are operating amid a torrent of fake news, lies, and conspiracy theories. There are those who claim that the pandemic agreement and IHR will cede sovereignty to WHO and give the WHO Secretariat the power to impose lockdowns or vaccine mandates on countries. You know, this is fake news, lies, and conspiracy theories. 
you know these claims are completely false. You know that the agreement will give WHO no, no such powers because you are writing it. We cannot allow this historic agreement, this milestone in global health to be sabotaged by those who spread lies either deliberately or unknowingly. We need your support to counter these lies by speaking up at home and telling your citizens that this agreement and an amended IHR will not and cannot cede sovereignty to WHO and that it belongs to the member states. The reality is quite the opposite. You're safeguarding national sovereignty while strengthening global health security. Those two things are not mutually exclusive. It's not a zero-sum game. The agreement is <coughs> negotiated by countries, for countries, and will be implemented in countries in accordance with your own national laws. And I know you're doing this considering into account that this will bring to your citizens. In fact, these processes have the potential to empower countries in critical ways. They can help to ensure that countries have the systems, tools, capacities, and infrastructure for effective, timely, and equitable pandemic prevention, preparedness, and response. This is not a choice between global health security and national or regional interests. It's about working together towards a safer, healthier, and more equitable world for all. Excellencies, dear colleagues and friends, there are still important differences under discussion, and these are difficult discussions. But it's crucial to remember that the differences are not about the goals. They are about the means to achieve those goals. There is a way to reach consensus. It's up to member states to be bold, to be creative, and to find the way forward. And I believe you will. As I said this morning, you will not reach consensus if everyone remains entrenched in their positions. It will take patience, it will take courage, it will take innovative thinking, and above all, compromise. It will take compromise and finding a, a middle ground. To deliver on time, everyone will have to give something, or no one will get anything. A special attention should be given to improving the capacity of all member states to detect and share pathogens that present a pandemic risk and to putting in place mechanisms so that member states have timely access to critical response products such as diagnostics, therapeutics and vaccines. I assure you of my support and that of my colleague regional directors and the entire Secretariat. This is the generation that lived through the COVID-19 pandemic. And this is the generation that must learn its painful lessons and protect the generations who will come after us. And I thank you and chair back to you. Thank you very much, DG, for your inspiring uh, uh, opening remarks. Uh, on behalf of the Trey, it's my pleasure now to give the floor to uh, uh, Dr. Bloomfield and uh, Dr. Ash uh, Dr. Asiri, who is with us online to brief the EB members on the WJHR uh, work. Dr. Ashley Bloomfield. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Majeur, and uh, I want to acknowledge and thank the EB Chair and EB members for this opportunity. Thank you also to DG Tedros, not just for your comments now, but for your support for this process right from the start. And we uh, know we can count on your support and the support and hard work of the Secretariat. 
I want to touch very briefly on the process of the WGIHR and then focus on two key issues that I would like the EB members to consider and, and provide their feedback and discussion about. But with respect to our process, I'd like to make three quick comments. First, our work has been conducted right from the outset with a very good spirit of cooperation and collective intent. We have a strong uh, bureau that is working exceptionally well as a team and I must acknowledge and thank my co-chair, Dr. Abdullah Asiri, who's on the call and who uh, will make a comment after me, I'm sure. The second point about our process is we are making progress. However, with more than 300 amendments to consider, it has taken time for us to work through those amendments and start to move towards consensus. I'm pleased to say that at our December meeting last year, that momentum built towards consensus, and it was great to see the progress being made. And we have been greatly assisted in our work by an excellent uh, expert committee report uh, that was commissioned by the DG and that has really assisted us in uh, making good progress. And the final comment, and my colleagues who are the co-chairs of the INB process will talk more to this, but the two processes, the, the WGIHR and the INB, are clearly interdependent and closely connected. And we need to, and can, I can assure you, we are working closely together. And I want to thank my co-chairs uh, and the members of the INB Bureau for that spirit of collective work. Two key issues I would ask executive board members to consider. The first, and I should say both of these DG Tedros has touched on. The first is we have just two meetings left to finalize the IHR amendments so that they can be approved and adopted at the WHA this May. It is vital we meet this, meet this deadline, as it will take a further 18 months for any amendments to come into force. And as DG Tedros alluded to, we all know that the sense of urgency around pandemic prevention, preparedness and response is waning. We need to grasp this moment and maintain our sense of urgency. So now is the time for member states to redouble their collective commitment to and support for this process. We need your full support as EB members and indeed the support of all member states to make sure that your negotiators have both the mandate and the flexibility to achieve consensus during these last two meetings so that we end up with changes that truly strengthen the IHR and better prepare us all and enable more equitable uh, pandemic prevention, preparedness and response. The second point I would ask EB members to consider carefully is, as the, as the DG has alluded to, this coordinated and sophisticated campaign that is attempting to undermine both these processes and indeed the WHO itself through misinformation and disinformation and linking that to various conspiracy theories. Governments and some politicians, individual politicians in many countries are being targeted, and I suspect many of you are aware of this in your own country. A key assertion of these theories is that the process is being driven by WHO to increase its power and its ability to direct countries, and that it will undermine national sovereignty. We are, of course, fully aware this is nonsense and that this is a fully member state driven process. It is essential that member states reiterate that th this point domestically and also fully support the DG in his efforts and the efforts of WHO to respond to and counter this mis and disinformation. We can't let the DG do this alone. It includes us uh, mobilizing key actors within our countries that understand and support the importance of these two processes. I'd like to hand over now to Dr. Asiri to see if he has any other comments, uh, and then back to you. Thank you again, Chair and EB members. Thank you very much, uh, Ashley, and uh, very warm uh, greetings from Saudi Arabia to the Executive Board Chair and members, and uh, uh, special thanks for inviting us to update you on the process. I will not add much to what have been said by my colleague, uh, Dr. Blomfield, uh, just to um, 
let you know that we are really progressing uh, uh, in the process of the uh, amendment uh, discussion. We have um, already reached a very advanced stage in uh, reaching a consensus in uh, five articles and annexes, and we have uh, additional 21 annexes and uh, articles that are in the uh, second iteration of the bureau text, and we hope that the, in the next uh, two meetings of the working group, we will be able to reach a consensus. And um, we have elected in the process of the WGI chart to uh, leave some of the um, foundational articles, uh, namely articles and definitions, purpose and scope and principles to the uh, final stages of the uh, process. Uh, keeping in mind that uh, these uh, discussions will be forwarded uh, by uh, discussions on other uh, articles that are directly related to these foundational articles. Uh, we are very optimistic that uh, we will be able to meet the deadline that was given to us by member states, and um, we are um, asking for additional support from uh, UAB members and from uh, member states in uh, progressing the discussion forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, co-chairs uh, of the WGHR, Dr. Blumfing and Dr. Asiri. And now it's my pleasure to give the floor to uh, <coughs> Dr. Machusu and uh, Mr. Uh, Roland Ries for a quick briefing on the INB work. But on top of that, uh, Precious will uh, also uh, speak about the common uh, issues among, between the two processes. Back to you, Coaches. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, happy to be here with you all to, to brief you briefly, actually, on the state of play on the IMB, because I presume that many of you already heard back from your own colleagues who are part of this, of course. So I would like to save as much time as possible for you to ask us any questions if you might have them. Um, the intergovernmental negotiation body, that's, that's the body in which we do our negotiations for what we call the pandemic treaty, is, is, is the other side of the coin of, of the work in the IHR, which we just heard. And, and in an ideal world, maybe you would have started making one big instrument of these two things, but we were, well, we have an IHR already and we did not have a pandemic treaty yet, so that's why we have two separate tracks now. But like Ashley just said, we do everything we can to, to bring those two as good together as we can. Uh, and we, as all the member states, it's, it's Precious and myself as, as, as co-chairs, and with the help of our colleagues from um, Japan, Thailand, Egypt and Brazil, we try to steer and uh, support this process as much as we can. And i um, just like to echo everything that, that Ashley said concerning the IHR. This is a member state-led process. We help the member states in getting where they, they want to be, and, um, and hopefully that will lead to a success in, in, in coming May. Um, one of the slides we provided you with is the purpose of a legally binding agreement, and I think many of us, including the DG himself, he already said why we are doing this. Uh, we all know why we are doing this. We came from a pandemic in which we learned the hard way that uh, we as a world, as, as a collectivity here in the WHO, were not ready to, to face a pandemic collectively. We, we mainly did it regionally or nationally, but not as a group. Uh, and, and we're only as strong as, 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 as the, sh the weakest link. It's, it's a cliche, but it's true. And uh, that's why we need to work together, help each other getting where we want to be and, and be as strong as possible when it comes to preparing for, responding to and, and, and acting on pandemics. Um, so the timeline. And um, the timeline has passed significantly, and we only have a few more months left till May next year, or this year, excuse me. Um, and that's a very short time frame we have left. We have two sessions of two weeks left to do all the work we still need to do, which is um, extremely lot of work. And we can only do this if we really want it to be done collectively and together. Uh, we can show you, help you show the way, but it should be the member states themselves that are ready and comfortable with what we have on the table to agree with. That's only a couple of more months. Uh, we've come a long way. Yeah? We, we, unlike the IHR, where we had a basis 
we had nothing. We had a blank sheet, and that's how we started. We said, okay, member states, we, this is a white piece of paper. What do we think we need? So we started collecting all those ideas, which was a time-consuming process, but also a very meaningful and learning for process because then we heard from everybody what was on their <coughs> minds, what they really needed when it came to pandemic prevention and preparedness and response. Um, what we did with the help of the Secretariat was bringing that all together, trying to make it uh, a meaningful, cohesive piece of paper, treaty, negotiation text, whatever you want to call that, and that is what's on the table now and what all the member states are working on very hard in making that as realistic, as good as, as precise, as concrete as possible uh, for May this year. And then um, we have set out a couple of key uh, thoughts and ideas which would steer and, and guide our work. That's equity as a priority, because we all saw that the response globally was not equitable. Uh, but, but saying equity is not the same thing as, as making it work. So it's a lot of work in trying to, to, to make that concrete and trying to get countries behind the concept of equity in the way we will write it down. We also say it should be future proof that that makes sense because the next pandemic lies in the future and we should be ready for that when it comes. Science, like with all the work of the WHO, that is the basis of everything and, and, and that relates to what, what colleague Ashley said with, with all the well, fake news and, 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 and deliberate attempts of, of putting this into, well, in the shadows of where it, it doesn't belong, this part of work, with, with questions being asked in all our parliaments in pieces on internet where, where, where everybody says what horrible things we might be doing, which is of course not the case as you can read for yourself when you read the text and everybody would be in the same position. It should be ambitious, it should be innovative. Um, and it should contain clear commitments because I think we think that this can only be done if everybody makes commitments. And those commitments are not always the same kind of commitments. Uh, but in the end, we have to understand that we all strive for the same thing. That it's, it's a safer world, a more equitable world when it comes to pandemics. And that a country like the Netherlands might need something else in a country like South Africa. But we all need something and we should all be working together in, in making that happen. And um, when you look at the most critical issues that are still outstanding, um, that is what you can read in that, in that slide we've provided you with uh, on the subgroups we are having. Our vice chairs are working on specific topics out of the text we have provided them with. And what it shows is that those really reflect the fact that we all need something. Uh, for example, European countries would like to see that the world puts more money and effort in preventing it. Preventing pandemics from happening, while other countries, like the African countries, for example, say that's all very well, but we need to be helped in making that work. Uh, we need the knowledge, we need money to do that, because it's, it's, it, doesn't come, it doesn't come cheap. And what we also need is access to, to medical countermeasures, for example. So there's a lot of things that need to be balanced in the work that lies ahead of us. And, and only if we make that happen, if we allow each other that balance and that um, that success that we all need, uh, and when we find each other in that, that's the only way of making this happen. And what are then our biggest challenges? And we wrote down a couple of them in the slides you have, but I would actually say there are two other challenges which, in my view, are the main challenges, and that is slipping urgency. And when, we, when we started this work two years back, the whole world spoke about COVID, about the pandemic, and that we should do a better job in, 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 in cooperating. But we are two years down the line and, and COVID is, is, is in some countries a, a memory from the past almost, although we still have it, but well, it's, it's like a flu, some people say. Uh, and there are so many other things in the world that, that attract our attention. And there are wars in different places in the world, there is climate, there are so many things, there is inflation that that attract our attention and, and, and the money from our governments, but it would be such a mistake and it would be a shame if we would not learn the lessons from the COVID pandemic and we would not set our mind to 
finishing this work, although we all understand that uh, there are so many things that require our attention. And the other one I already mentioned, it's time. Normally you would take seven years to accomplish something like this, but we gave ourselves two years, which is extremely short, so we should be not too harsh on ourselves uh, whilst acknowledging that this is not so easy to accomplish. And, um, because actually it's, 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 it's a main achievement if we would be able to pull this off in two years and we could be really proud of ourselves if we would be able to and I trust that we will. Um, then some of your questions might be about uh, the IHR, the IMB already said it. They have everything to do with each other and, and Precious you will say a few words on that. Thank you. Good afternoon. When the World Health Assembly met it was at a time when it had a special session. It was the second time that we had a special session. The second time in the establishment of the World Health Organization. So it means they attached significance to this process. Like we heard this process of coming up with an international legal instrument is an important process because it is not only generational but it's something that should help us make this a safer and fairer world. We can account for multiple problems of what is it that we saw, we experienced during COVID but we can also go on about other outbreaks and other epidemics and pandemics. But I don't think this is the purpose today. The purpose is to show you why we need two legal instruments. We heard from the co-chairs of WGIHR how they've progressed, but we also heard from Roland what is it that we've done and how far we've gone. But there are challenges with regard to having two instruments, one that exists and one that is new. The new one, of course, comes with anxieties and uncertainties, but of course that happened with IHR when it was still developed. We also did not know what the outcome will be, but we have an opportunity in a lifetime to make sure that we can have two instruments that can coexist, that can be implemented at country level. So with regard to the process that we followed, there are common issues that have emerged as we're developing both these two instruments. Because we have the same member states and it's the member states led process for both processes. We do not have experts sitting somewhere writing the instruments. It's member states themselves who say this is how they would like to see the IHR amended. They would like to see what must be incorporated in the pandemic agreement. And for that reason, we've established that there are topics that seem to overlap in both instruments. So the first one is about distribution of topics across the two instruments. We have to know what is suitable for IHR and what is it that would be appropriate for the pandemic agreement. But also in terms of the breadth and the content of what is it that must assure us of a future-proof instrument. And, and for that reason, we have to establish that for both instruments. The third is about the level of flexibility in the negotiation process and to what extent can member states show flexibility so that we can achieve consensus uh, during this uh, negotiation process. And like what uh, Roland explained earlier, that we've got very, very tight timelines. There is also what has been said as misinformation about sovereignty. I do not think that any member states led process can expose member states to sovereignty issues because they are the ones making decisions about what must be contained in the pandemic agreement, but also what kind of amendments must be incorporated in the IHR as the process 
uh, has been described by the co-chairs of the WGIHR. There are also issues about financing mechanisms that must be inclusive and how the governance arrangements. And I think for purposes of these discussions, it's your duty and responsibility as the executive board to determine what kind of governance mechanisms would be appropriate for these two instruments so that implementations can be possible and also the monitoring systems for both instruments can be enabled. So we do have key messages for you. The first is that we need some constructive approach on how best we can move this process forward. Like we said, we, are, we have very, very limited time. So in May, when you meet, the expectation is that you will adopt the two instruments. The expectation is that as you adopt the in two instruments, you'll be comfortable with what is it that you'll be adopting. But also, equity has come up as a key issue. I went back to read all the statements that were made in May during the special session. Almost all member states said equity was important. During our deliberations, we've heard again that equity is important. So it, there is an expectation that equity will be adequately addressing the instruments. But we also recognize that both the pandemic agreement and the IHR amendments will be delivered by May 2024. So we don't need to lose momentum because there is a lot of enthusiasm in these negotiations. There should be political will, and I think that we've established and that we've experienced. We'd like a commitment to maintaining this universality, but also we've seen a lot of leadership amongst member states. We've seen in the subgroups your commitments, your engagements, and the sacrifice. You meet long hours, but you still meet, and you still come up with proposals. Sometimes you disagree, but as long as the disagreement help us to propel the work forward. In conclusion, we'd like to encourage you to seize this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, as the DG said, the opportunity to build an international rule-based system that can ensure that we've got equitable pandemic prevention preparedness and response system that works for all of us. So to articulate the linkages between the two instruments, it's, it's quite clear that member states must ensure that we have a comprehensive legal framework for the global health emergencies to work properly, but also to strengthen our pandemic prevention, preparedness and response. I thank you. Thank you, Precious, and uh, thank you, Roland, for uh, the, an update on the work of the INB, but also on the com common issues between the two processes. I think we are, still have some time for some questions and answers. If any members do have questions for the co-chairs, either the WJHR or the INB, I'm sure they will be happy to answer to your questions. Let me first by starting by France. France, you have the floor. Bonjour à tous. Um, a very good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much uh, for this discussion. Two uh, remarks uh, very briefly, just to say that France agrees with the Bureau's analysis uh, that we need to try to meet the deadline that's been set us. Uh, that's very important. And the second thing, you um, also said, uh, Director General, and that is that uh, prevention plays an important role and uh, One Health is a very practical uh, way in the field of ensuring that uh, these texts have real impact. I do have two questions I'd like to put to you. Firstly, you pointed out uh, that discussions within the group had uh, permitted some progress in the discussions. Given the deadline, uh, are these uh, discussions expected to continue? <coughs> That's my first question. And then secondly, we see that the um, Canada is now very challenging and the international experts have made an important contribution and perhaps could make uh, 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 more contributions in terms of making progress given the need to try to meet the deadline that's been set. Thank you. Thank you, France. Men? 
شكرا جزيلا سيد الرئيس سيد الجلدة. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chair, and uh, allow me to say at the outset uh, how I'd like uh, to thank uh, the WGIHR and the INB for their efforts. I want to mention uh, an issue that I'd like to discuss, and that is how to strengthen cooperation uh, to combat uh, uh, international uh, pandemics uh, across border the challenges where you have different levels of capacities, in particular uh, uh, between neighboring countries. For example, um, last November, Yemen uh, had to uh, face a cholera outbreak uh, with uh, migrants coming from Africa and uh, bringing it into the country and uh, 97,000 uh, came from the Horn of Africa uh, to Yemen and we saw some uh, communicable diseases uh, breaking out and uh, that's why I think we need to work extremely closely uh, on joint initiatives uh, between countries of that area, uh, that region, and Yemen. But unfortunately, we didn't see strong collaboration in that respect. So how do we uh, face, uh, how do we uh, try to face these uh, challenges, these epidemics in some places in Yemen and Somalia? Is this draft agreement intended to help us uh, find uh, solutions to such challenges? Thank you. It's my pleasure to give the floor now to the United, United States of America, please. Thank you very much, um, and, and I want to thank the, all of the co-chairs, the co-chairs of both bureaus, um, both online and in person, um, for responding to our, our request as a board. Uh, it was a helpful readout indeed, and I, I do have a couple of questions um, across both, if I may. Um, I will just, though, um, first of all, just reiterate something I said this morning about the importance of seizing the moment and the commitment of our government to see this through on the original timeline. We do believe that that is essential, particularly given um, what all of you have said about the, not just the sense of urgency, but the need for urgency, the requirement of urgency in this moment. I also um, I think, Ashley, you um, might have mentioned this as well, uh, the, the fact that these two processes are linked, not just in the way that Precious described in overlapping topics, but um, in the way that really um, this work will will need to be implemented. Um, and um, it's, it's very clear to us, those of us at the table, that there is a lot of overlap across both. And we really appreciate the work being done by both bureaus to try and understand um, sort of where, what belongs where. I think we would like m even more concrete guidance um, as member states <laughs> from you all um, as to what you recommend, um, especially given, um, uh, you know, there's sort of a risk as one process um, sort of falls flat or feels delayed that the other process also falls behind. And, and I don't know if everyone fully understands outside this room the risk of sort of losing both potentially. Um, and that's not something that we, we'd want to see uh, happen. Um, I, I think we'll also, something I, I might have mentioned earlier is just how hard we're working um, across all member states. It seems to be as creative as possible and just any guidance that we do get, particularly from, from co-chairs on IMB, given, given how far away that process feels, any guidance you can give us as to how we can truly find compromise across these various solutions, I think will be helpful. Um, you know, I, there's just a lot of important proposals being put on the table. Um, and so when people ask me how this is going, um, I still point to a hopefulness um, because of the way people are showing up. Even this room is full, right? All of your, all of your negotiations have been well attended. Um, and even beyond member states, there's still an open question of how other stakeholders are being brought into the process again, because these are the stakeholders who do understand what we're trying to do. Um, these are the stakeholders who do 
want to push back against misinformation and really break through in terms of real solutions. And so these are the stakeholders that I think we need to keep engaged um, and not just engaged, but informed about how their interventions are really making an impact. Um, so, so very much appreciate you all's, you all's focus in that regard. Just finally on this topic of misinformation, um, this is something that I know we have talked about as a board as well, um, but we in the U.S. are committed to joining other member states and ensuring that we continue to um, educate um, the public and our policymakers about what these negoti negotiations are and are not. Um, I think it could be helpful for us to also continue to share those practices with each other as member states. I'm not sure if there's often space to do that, but as these negotiations come to conclusion, hopefully in the next several months, um, we know that a lot of that mis and disinformation might ramp up. And so as we're, you know, accelerating the pace <laughs> uh, on the details, I think we also need to accelerate efforts or even elevate efforts in, as DG said, in our education and communication. Apologies, I hope that was clear. I just landed this morning from a seven hour flight, so I'm doing my best. <laughs> Thank you very much, USA. And now it's my pleasure to give the floor to Barbados. Yes, thank you so much. So let me first by start by congratulating the co-chairs on the tremendous work and effort they have try to achieve over a very short period of time. Um, you, as you are well aware, Barbados is a tourism development, um, developing. It's a SIDS country and its economy is based on tourism. And therefore there is significant travel and movement of people across our borders. So there are three interventions. We need timely sharing of information to small island developing states. We need to have equal access to technologies and other um, areas in public health, such as um, access to vaccinations on an extremely urgent basis and not very late into the pandemic. And we need to finally make sure that states such as Barbados, who do not have much human resource capacity to be at the negotiating table, their voices need to be heard. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mr. Barbados. Morocco, have the floor. Thank you very much indeed. And allow me to thank all of those uh, who've put in so much work for these uh, processes uh, over the past uh, uh, almost two years uh, on uh, amendments uh, to the IHR and the INB. In all of the statements that we've just heard, speakers have requested that uh, EB members support these uh, teams more effectively to try to accelerate the progress towards consensus. So my question is, how can we support you? Can you help us to help you? And then secondly, if um, the negotiations were not to meet the May 2024 deadline, what measures do you intend to take to overcome that failure, if you like? And what would the consequences of such a failure be on our preparation and uh, response to future pandemics? Thank you. Shukran Jazeelan. Thank you. I think I don't see any <coughs> requests for the floor. With your permission, I will uh, now move to the coaches for to respond to your questions. And I will start by Dr. Bloomfing and Dr. Asiri online. Ashley, Abdullah. Thank you, Gerard, and can I thank uh, EB members for their questions and comments and indeed support. Uh, three quick comments from me, and the first relates to the deadline. 
Certainly in our process, we've been very clear that our mandate is to report back a package of targeted amendments for consideration at this year's uh, WHA. And given that is the extent of our mandate and the urgency and imperative that we update the IHR, that, remain, that remains our very clear intent and focus. And that I can also say is the intent and focus of the members of the working group, that is the member states or, or state parties to the IHR. So we're very focused on that deadline and we will be undertaking our work uh, with a view to ensuring we meet that deadline. Uh, France raised the issue of uh, input from international experts. We've got an excellent report. Uh, however, the, the committee was convened to provide that report, but the process really now is member state driven. It is a negotiation and we call for expertise where we require it or it adds value through the Secretariat and uh, that process has been working well on a range of topics. My second comment relates to the points made by Yemen and Barbados and this is about ensuring that through the implementation of this process we are building capacity so that the IHR can be implemented equitably so that countries can have access to what they need to ensure they can implement the IHR in full. And this has been a very big part of our work and our discussion and uh, will be part of the consensus we reach. So a very high priority for us is to ensure that not just the updated IHR are completed, but that we have paved the way for successful implementation. And uh, finally, the request from Morocco, which related to EB support. And I'd just like to go back to the two comments I made initially. I think there are two key things. First of all, ensuring that uh, negotiators, not just from executive board countries, but from all member states, have the mandate and flexibility to help us achieve consensus over these next uh, two meetings in February and April. And secondly, to work very hard with the Secretariat and support the DG in his efforts to counter the mis and disinformation. And I think the USA also raised the important role that other stakeholders can play here, uh, who uh, are a key part of countering that uh, mis and disinformation and really supporting these processes, because there is an intent of some of those trying to undermine the processes to ensure that they don't uh, finish, to, that they do fail. That's not our intent and the, the full support of EB members and indeed member states will be essential there. Thank you. Abdullah, any comment from your side? Uh, thank you very much. Just one quick um, response to the question of, of the overlap between the two processes. Uh, I think it's more of, um, if we uh, look to it in a different way, it's more of um, shared topics between the two processes. The uh, Many of these uh, shared topics, uh, it was clear uh, with the progressive discussions in, the, in both tracks that it will not be possible to just to assign them to one track and then leave them uh, undiscussed in the other track. An example of that is the uh, financing uh, track for health emergencies. Uh, both uh, processes are discussing that, but from different angles, similar things to the uh, implementation of uh, the articles of both the IHR and also the treaty. Um, these are shared uh, topics, but uh, I mean, addressing them from different angles. So um, we, we see them as more of a shared uh, uh, interest to both groups rather than being uh, an area of conflict or overlap. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Asiri and Dr. Bloomfing. And now I will uh, give the floor to Roland and Precious for the INB. Thank you very much and thank you for the questions which are very often spot on, I think. And um, not want to repeat the colleagues who just spoke, but picking out a few things I heard from your side. And uh, so let me start first with our colleague from Barbados, who, who actually pointed out pretty clearly why we need an improved IHR and why we need an IMB. Because the things you mentioned that you need as a country are, are 
pretty much uh, addressed in both instruments, and, and, and that's why we need that collectivity of those approaches and, and um, to the fullest extent. And only if we make sure that the IHR works and that we complement it with things in the IMB, we can do the things that a country like yours needs. Um, furthermore, um, our colleague from Morocco, um, you said a couple of things, but one of the things was, I think, is uh, what if we fail? What if we do not live up to the mandate we have and delivering and, and something in May 24? And the easiest thing I can say is, well, I don't want to think about that uh, because we have to, because uh, there are a lot of reasons why we should not uh, go that path. Uh, but of course, we are just as clever as everybody in this room, and we also have in the back of our minds uh, a scenario where we might need to have to think about that, uh, but we like to um, leave that aside as long as possible, but basically because if we do not meet that mandate, we will be in a very, very difficult place, and uh, we do not want to put that on the table yet. Um, you want to add anything precious to this? No, th th thank you very much uh, uh, to France, you and, and I think a, a couple of other member states about the calendar. <coughs> the May 24 is a set calendar, but what we'll be doing is to just give you, you know, for predictability so that you can prepare properly. We'll be communicating as to how we'll work from now until May, when you finally put your stamp and say, approved for both instruments. And I think the two, uh, 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 the, 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 the co-chairs of the two bodies uh, will be meeting regularly uh, and, and aligning, and, and we're going to meet quite regular uh, from now onwards. Not that we've not been meeting, we have, but I think it's going to be uh, frequent, more frequent than it has been. Um, the, the next one is, uh, Yemen was asking about cooperation. We, we actually have Article 16 in the uh, uh, pandemic agreement that deals with international cooperation. And I would advise and encourage uh, Yemen to go back and see whether is that adequate because that's, in our opinion, what we've worked on and what we think will help. Um, uh, U.S. absolutely, uh, we should seize the moment, and like you said, we'd like to have concrete guidance. We will be communicating this uh, 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 shortly, even in advance of the, of the meeting in, on the 19th of February. And this will also do as we meet with the, with the uh, co-chairs of or WGIHR. Um, Barbados, absolutely. Uh, if, you, if you go through the instrument, you'll realize that we've got very specific provisions uh, that uh, deal with equity, uh, Articles 9, 10, 11, 13, but of course those are still subject of negotiations. And we fully agree that as we plan our meetings, we always take into account that uh, small delegations are not compromised. And I see uh, Switzerland is in the room. They always remind us of that about small delegations, and we've taken note of that uh, uh, specifically. Uh, Morocco, you're right. I mean, there's always a risk, isn't it? But because this is a member state driven process, we appeal on all of you. If it fails, it would be member states who have failed. It would be member states who have failed their people. It will be member states who do not recognize that we lost lives and we lost livelihoods. And I do not think we can afford that. So let's make this work. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, President, and again, thank you for the co-chairs of the two processes to be with us today and for the briefing and for answering the questions. It's my real pleasure to give the floor to Mike Ryan for some concluding remarks. Um, thank you, Joad and Chair, and my uh, thanks to the Secretariat who've worked at <clears throat> inside WHO in support of the um, of the bureau, the chairs, and of the uh, of the the people doing the negotiations, uh, Joanna has led a fantastic team to provide that support. So, uh, uh, and thank you on behalf of us all, Joanne. Um It's very hard to to uh, summarise. Everyone has said the spoken about the absolute need to do this. 
the urgency, the necessity, all of these words. Uh, I will just add maybe to that uh, a reflection on who we all really serve, our communities. Uh, and our communities went through three years of horror, uh, and many other communities around the world dealing with everything from Lassa fever to yellow fever to Ebola, that, that horror is replaced on a regional or sub-regional basis, and on a daily basis, if we look at the likes of cholera today. Uh, communities are struggling to deal with this constant pressure of health emergencies, and on top of that, the fear of another pandemic. This pandemic didn't just affect the health sector. This ripped apart our social, economic, and political systems, and has become a multi-trillion dollar problem for the world. In fact, an existential issue in economic, political, and social terms. So it's incumbent upon us to tie those threads together. Uh, if this had been a war, we would be looking a world war, we would be looking at ways to reduce the risk of a future one. We'd be looking at ways to ensure that it didn't happen again and to reduce its impact. We'd be looking for the means to avoid the pain in future. And that is the rules-based international system, the multilateral system has been created to do that, which is to reduce the impact of inconsistency and incoherence between member states, bring agreement on things that can be agreed and deliver for our communities together, even in the midst, even in the midst of geopolitical disagreements over so many things around the world at the moment. I think this is one thing the world agrees on, um, and one thing that something can be done about. Because sometimes I look at global problems, and Tedros uh, teaches me a lot, and see the intractability of those problems. Uh, Tedros doesn't do that. He tries to see the opportunity what can be done rather than what cannot be done. And this is one of the few areas, I believe, in international multilateral affairs where we have the same objective, as Tedros said. We just disagree on how to get there uh, and the means. Uh, but we have one chance. And I would say that to you on behalf of health workers around the world. Uh, I've worked, and many of my colleagues have, on the front line of epidemic response for most of my medical life. Uh, we've seen our colleagues uh, behave and perform so bravely. We've lost colleagues. How many health workers were lost in the midst of this pandemic? How many lives were lost because of the lack of access to appropriate care? Um, and how many communities were broken apart by the tragedy of, of losing a generation of wise, generally older persons? Uh, it's a shock that we've not got over. Uh, the, the Accord or the Treaty um, it won't fix everything. There's a huge amount of work to do. <clears throat> but what it will do is provide an anchor, a platform, a mandate to move forward and build the systems that we need for the, for the future, to build the community protection, to build the collaborative surveillance, to build the access to countermeasure platforms, to build safe, scalable clinical care, to build better coordination and decision making. It will give us the chance to achieve that. My fear as a frontliner is that without that member state ownership, this could break into a whole series of different initiatives that have absolutely no coherent governance. Um, and I don't think we should leave to the future to that chance. So this is the one opportunity we have under the leadership of, uh, of the World Health Assembly to come to an agreement. And uh, I would... Uh, plead with you on behalf of the health workers of the world that can speak as one, on behalf of the communities that they serve, now is the time. We have one chance to do this and uh, uh, I think that the message has to be get it done. That's the message I would say would come from health workers around the world, get this done. Whatever it is, get this done. Do not waste this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. <clears throat> and. Uh... On behalf of the AB Chair, I would like to thank you for uh, attending this very important uh, uh, information session. Like USA said, your presence today uh, with this number of attendees uh, show uh, how much member states are given uh, as importance to these two processes. And uh, at least from the Secretariat perspective, we are very keen to continue to support these two processes. And uh, on behalf of my small team, I would like to thank the two bureau members for their huge work, but also thank many, many members that are volunteering either as a co-facilitator or as volunteering to help drafting in this process. And this is a common 
common issue that we all of us we are playing a role to make it successful and uh, wish you all the best and wish you to meet in May with uh, approving the two uh, instrument amended IHR and a new agreement on behalf of the AB chair I would like to declare this meeting is uh, over thank you very much I'm really surprised that they didn't turn the comments off on this but there weren't that many people that viewed the video. Like I said, this video had been in stealth mode, but I figured I would just blast it out here because I want you guys to be aware of what is going on because this affects every one of us. It doesn't matter where you're from in the world. This is, this is really serious, and they are making it to a point where you got to wonder, what do they have planned up their sleeve that they have to meet this critical deadline, like as if the world is going to end if they don't get it signed in May? You know, that makes you wonder. But what do you guys think? Definitely leave your thoughts below. If you haven't had a chance to check out the video I did about the WHO pandemic treaty in a little more depth, please go check that out over at the reading room. I'll link it below. But as always, I will be back with more content. But until then, please be safe and I will talk to you soon. Bye. It was such a broad. <laughs>